one of my dreams about about Quince was also to write a cookbook. Barbara beat me to it. We happened to be at the same conference one one year in Oregon. I noticed that she was calling herself the Queen of Quince. Well, I had been calling myself the Quince Queen for for uh, quite a few years, and I don't know who who got to be queen first, but we had a conversation and agreed that. She would be the queen of quince and I would be the quince queen. So there we are. Apples, make them pop. Pop, 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 pop. Hey, hey, hey. My name is Rhea Windcaller and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. Now we know what happens when two queens meet face to face. They basically decide upon their titles, as told by Edith Walden, our featured guest on this week's episode 327. She was retelling a meetup with author Barbara Gazarian of the cookbook called Simply Quince, which I highly recommend, by the way, and there's a link to that book in the show notes for this here episode. And now we know Barbara is the queen of quinces, and Edith is the quince queen. And we're going to be hearing from the quince queen shortly. She's going to be telling us all about how she got into growing quince, how she is selling this both to a retail market and to cider makers, and describing how Each of the quince varieties that she works with, and there's about 13 that she works with, what she's learned about them and how they taste and a little bit more about each one, where they're from. It's such a fascinating story. And I know that quince is definitely on the mind of many cider makers because melded together with apple juice, a quince is so aromatic that it lends a very cool profile to any cider. And also, there are many makers who are now making standalone fermented quince drinks, which is absolutely fantastic for this fruit, which has been forgotten ever since pectin has been discovered. Because at one time, quince was a really dominant fruit that you'd see on the market because people were using the heavy pectin within each little orb of quince to help their food processing. You know, back in the day when we didn't have powdered pectin, this was the way to help make jellies and jams and all the things that one would do on a homestead. When that kind of went out of favor, well, so did the quince. But the quince is coming back full speed ahead and partly due for people like Edith, who on a whim decided to grow quince and get into it and discover the magic of quince. In fact, we even have our own Mr. Quince here on Cider Chat. What do you think about the future of quince moving forward for both folks who like to cook with it and to ferment quince too? I like to quote Lizzo from her song About Damn Time with the lyric, It's About Damn Time. I like how you are to the point, Mr. Quince, always to the point. Roger that. All right. Well, we're going to take a little quick break here. And when I come back, I have a wee bit of news from out and about in Ciderville. On the first week of November, it is the return of Cider Days, and we are rebooting it as Cider Days 2.0. There's going to be a Calvados and American Apple Brandy tasting kicking off the event on Friday night, November 4th. Then on Saturday morning, there'll be the first workshop of the day with John Bunker talking about orcharding for homeowners. So this is a perfect workshop to attend if you are a homeowner with one to, let's say, five, maybe 10 trees, but that might be a lot for the average homeowner. We really wanted to hone in for that smaller size orchard. But of course, when you're talking with John Bunker, anything he talks about is good for homeowners and commercial orchardists alike. So something for everyone coming up on Saturdays at 2.0. And if you want to find out more about this event and when tickets will be going on sale, do sign up for the eCider News at ciderchat.com. 
And make sure to follow Cider Chat and all the different social media channels, such as the Facebook page on Twitter at Cider Chat and Instagram at Cider Chat Ciderville. But there's also one other social media account I really want to draw you to where there will be updates about Cider Days 2.0. And that is called I Love Cider Days, which is exactly what people say to me all the time when I meet them and they're asking me about Cider Days. When is it coming back? How is it returning? What's going on? And they just say over and over again, I love Cider Days. So we have that social media channel. Check out the Facebook page. That's where some of the first things will be going up live. If you don't have that, there is an Instagram account that's going to be getting more on board as we're getting closer. Tickets go on sale this August for the Calvados and American Apple Brandy Tasting. And you don't want to miss it because it's going to be amazing. And you don't want to miss out on it. You know, you'll be like, you know, trying to have to find a beer bar or something to go to while we're all drinking apple brandy and calvados. Uh, I just don't want to see that. I want you don't experience that kind of FOMO. Instead, follow along on this here podcast and keep your eye out on social media accounts, hashtag Cider Days, and the news will be there. Good stuff ahead. In fact, um, for those of you who know this particular gent, I'm going to be talking to Field Maloney, of West County Cider. Uh, he's going to be coming on over to my little special spot of Ciderville, and we'll be going to be talking about Cider Day. So I'm sure I'll have an update for you about that coming up, maybe as early as next week. Who knows? You would think it wouldn't be super busy right now, but for me right now, it is slamming because I'm also getting ready for my French cider tour that's going to Normandy and Brittany this coming September. I'm so stoked. So much going on for that. Um, it is sold out. You could always send your name in on a waiting list or for other future tours. I did say last week about the UK, right? If you want to go to the UK, send an email letting us know that you're interested. Don't wait until the last minute. Send it to info at ciderchat.com. All right, when I come back, I have a little bit of other news for you from out and about in Ciderville. As I mentioned, John Booker is going to be speaking at Cider Days 2.0 in November, but this here coming August, well, it's Apple Camp, and that's going to be taking place in Maine on August 19th through the 21st. And registration, they want you to register by the end of this month. It's a cool event because they're going to have orchardists coming in and cider makers from all over the map for a couple of days where you're just, you're not going anywhere. You're just hanging out at this camp. You know, you could camp out, you can rent a little cabin, and hear from the likes of John Bunker. I mean, the dude is the dude because, well, he's just the dude of apples. And there's other dudes and dudettes and other folks, too. So you're going to meet all of them by going to Apple Camp. Check it out by Googling the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association and go to the event page. Check out the registration info there. You're not going to want to miss it coming up this August. What an amazing time. And who doesn't want to say, hey, I'm going to Apple Camp. It's time now to head to our featured conversation with Edith Walden. Her company is called Willow Rose Bay Inc., and it's based on Guimas Island in Washington State. We're going to begin by hearing her journey into becoming a quince grower, and then, of course, we'll be getting into the varieties. And at the end of this here episode, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what she's thinking about in terms of transitioning out of becoming the primary grower for the quince here at Willow Rose Bay. But in the meanwhile, it's time to grab a glass, hopefully with a little bit of quince in there too, and join this chat with Edith Walton of Willow Rose Bay, Inc., located on Guimas Island in Washington State. My quince journey started in 1995 when I purchased land on Guimas Island, which is uh, part of the uh, San Juan Islands in Washington State. And the property that I purchased was in agricultural space, which meant that I needed to come up with a crop. And so I started looking at, I knew that I wanted to be uh, an organic uh, farm. And I started looking at a whole bunch of things. I, I thought about garlic, I thought about nettles and uh, rose hips and realized that none of those were really going to pencil out. 
there were some old fruit trees on the property and my uh, grandparents on both sides of my family had been orchardists. So I thought that doing fruit trees was going to be the thing to do. So because I was organic, I didn't think that I was going to be able to produce table fruit. So I, I decided that I was going to be doing preserves. And if I was going to be doing preserves, I knew that I wanted uh, apples and pears that had really strong flavors that would come through in the preserves. So I started looking at a lot of heirloom catalogs, and I kept running across this fruit called quince, which I had never heard of. I'd heard of flowering quince, but that was it. So I got interested and I started doing some more research. And the more I researched, the more fascinated I got with the whole idea of quince and realized that if I did quince, I would have a niche market. And um, that, you know, I love trying new things. And I was certain that everyone else would love to try new things too. And I actually found some quince, which was hard at that time to uh, practice cooking with. And I loved the results of uh, coming through, you know, and discovering that the very first marmalade was made out of quince. It just seemed perfect. So I took a flying leap of faith and planted 175 quince trees, in addition to apple trees and pears and aronia berries and a few plums and a few cherries and things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that basically was my was my beginning. The property that I own is uh, part of the very first homestead on Guimas Island. Uh, Guimas Island was actually um, Samish Indian territory, and they had uh, they actually lived on the island uh, during the winter. Many other tribes came here um, during the summer for uh, fishing and things like that. But the Samish had uh, a succession of two different longhouses. One 400 feet, another 200 feet. And in the 1850s, though, uh, settlers started coming out. And uh, the Matthews brothers, who came from Virginia um, in about 1858, had the homestead that I am on. I have a Gravenstein apple tree that is about 160 years old that uh, comes from that from that period that I did not chop down in order to plant the quince around it so um, so there's the mother tree that is uh, I believe supporting all the other poems in in the orchard this 160 year old gravity which is just amazing where is it located in in terms of the other quince? Because you're calling it the mother tree, right? So, Yes. Um, we're learning a lot more about plants and how they communicate with each other and how they feed off of each other and all of the universe in the soil that we know so little about, which is why I call it the mother tree. Mm-hmm. So the first four rows in in my orchard – uh, my orchard is about two, two and a half acres, um, and it's planted in the old tradition of s- trees actually spaced. They're not on trellises. Um, the quince is spaced. Uh, some of them are spaced nine feet apart. Some of them are spaced 12 feet apart. And so the first four rows are quince and then it moves to apples and pears and then back to quince again i have 250 trees altogether the gravenstein mother tree is in between the second and third row of quince and oh about two-thirds of the way down uh, the rows so it's it's pretty central 
uh, to the entire orchard. How is that tree doing now at 160? It has no heartwood in it at all. It is living completely with cambium. It's probably at least 25 feet tall. Uh, When I first moved there, there was a big branch that, a huge branch that fell, which meant that the tree was really leaning in one direction. And so I've been pruning it so that there's not so much weight on the one side and allowing the other side then to grow back out. So it's much more balanced, but it bears every single year. I leave the quince trees, uh, I prune them to being about eight to 10 feet tall because because of my age and the age of my workers. Um, I don't want, you know, I want us only working on six foot ladders uh, to be able to to harvest things because I did choose to do old fashioned trees. That means that I also do old fashioned harvesting as well. Let's get into the quince now because you have a a pretty wide assortment of varieties that most folks don't have. Did you start out with that wide set of varieties or have you been grafting onto quince? Because we haven't even talked about what you're doing with the quince yet, but you know, here you planted them and then At what point did you say, okay, this is a viable market? Uh, So I did choose a bunch of varieties because since there is no one growing quince up here, I had no one to be able to talk to about what was going to do well here, um, whether it was going to grow well at all. So I said it was a giant leap of faith. So I did start out with uh, 12 different varieties and uh, and also we wanted I needed things that were going to be spread out for harvest um, so that they weren't all coming, you know, needing to be harvested at the, at the same time. Since I do live on a small little island, having workers is a big problem. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to be dependent on having to bring in workers from the mainland um, and, and have that additional expense. Mm. I forgot what we were talking about. Well, well, in terms of, I know, it's like we want to talk about so many things that I feel like my brain is just pouring out with ideas. I want to ask you this and that. Uh, well, we talked a little bit about your journey. <laughs> Feels good to laugh. Be sure to leave this part in, okay? <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> it's like decompression time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was, I, right. oh, we, were, we were talking about. Oh, I know, we were talking about the canopy of the tree, and so I was explaining. Yeah. So, where do you want me to start? Well, you know, you planted these varieties. Uh, you you decided to like choose this niche market. The trees started growing, and did you have a vision for your business plan out of that? What you're going to be doing with this niche market? Did you know who you're going to be selling to at that point, or was it going to be jams or? You know, how did you approach that next step? So the idea was to have multiple varieties so that I could experiment and find out what was going to work and what wasn't going to work. Um, My idea at the beginning was that I was going to be doing a preserves business, uh, again, because I didn't think that I would be able to produce table fruit organically. Um, And... It took three years before I had any quince because that's what you need to do to uh, make sure that the trees get their roots established and everything else. And so then, then I started needing to figure out who my market was. And pretty right from the start, I realized that actually, and particularly because quince does not have a standard like apples do. You know, the apple standard is just incredibly stringent. You know, it has to be exactly the right size. It has to have exactly the right color. I had gone to my mentor who um, was Tom Thornton at Cloud Mountain Farm and volunteered there for a little bit to just watch their whole apple processing. And I was horrified at the fruit that had to be mm-hmm. called because mm-hmm. it didn't fit the standard. So 
I realized that I had made a good choice that way too, because there's no way that quince is ever going to have a standard because they just don't grow uniformly. And, um, but so I assumed that I was going to be able to uh, market to the co-ops, the Seattle co-ops. And it turned out that they the main co-op that I had belonged to for years and years and years required that you go through a broker, which just appalled me. Mm. So, uh, so I did find a high end market that I started with and uh, they were happy to have it. And then the next year we had the first whole foods in the whole Washington state area came in and I got in there right away. And so then for quite a while, I would go as Whole Foods continued to grow, I would continue to just deliver to each of the Whole Foods stores. And in the meantime, I also picked up some high end restaurants and I started my preserves business and uh, which is, you know, all of this is very small time. But viable, viable. I mean, enough for it's, you to. It's viable for you know for one person. I I'm a I'm a one person business, and um, at the time I was in the position where I could hire some people, but I realized after a while that no, I really needed to. And I was on the island part time for quite a while mm-hmm. until 2006, and then I moved here permanently. And mm-hmm. and by that time, I realized that I really needed to be here myself to be able to to adequately do the business Mm -hmm. a typical year i would be delivering uh maybe three thousand pounds um of fruit to them uh and my but my total outcome is is maybe about ten thousand pounds um -hmm. a, a year which for an orchard is really small. It really like has quite a fragrance yes. to it. it. It like one little quince goes a long, long way. Yes, yes, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, that I, just has to be known, right? That's yeah, it for truth. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. When, when I have people come visit the farm in the fall, you know, w- one of the main attractions is walking into the cold storage room, <laughs> you know, where it's just overwhelmingly quince so yeah oh i i could just imagine i'm just imagining what your house smells like and just like the land the thing about the blossoms is that they are single blossoms unlike apples which turns out to be a really good thing because i knew a lot about fruit and and agriculture uh i helped start the community garden program and this for the city of seattle but i did not know about thinning i knew about pruning but not thinning and believe me if the quince needed to be thinned like apples did i would not be in business <laughs> so uh-huh. Uh-huh. um can you so, explain a little bit about that for people who don't really understand what you're talking sure. about sure Sure. So, so apples uh, grow in clusters, and uh, when you're in commercial production, you need to thin those clusters down because the apples will, if they all uh, come to fruition, it over uh, stresses the tree, and the trees tend to go into a biennial bearing kind of process so then you won't have any the the next year and also they'll be small so they won't be commercially viable so with apples you have to go in and literally drop about 75 percent of the apples and um because i'm organic and i you know that's all done by hand Mm -hmm. and it's just it's it's my least favorite job in orcharding. Sure. And so if I'd had to do that for 175 point trees, there's just no way that, mm-hmm. that it could get done. So the blossoms are much bigger than um, an apple blossom, but they are separate. But they also don't have a lot of fragrance and they're more like pear um, blossoms that don't have a lot of fragrance. And therefore, they're also a little tricky to get pollinated because they're not being the, the honeybees 
are not naturally attracted to them. And so I've discovered that I do have to have bees right there in the orchard, that I can't depend on the neighboring bees. Um, or, and it's too, too many trees for just the bumblebees and the other natural pollinators to be able to take care of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but they are gorgeous when yeah. they're, when they're in bloom. It's just, it's really, it's really a sight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, most of the quince that I see around here are like in a bush. And we had this conversation before. You have quince yeah. trees, yeah. like yeah. with a single, you know, trunk coming up. And then. Yeah, no, yeah. They're, they're they're just like like apple trees. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're on semi dwarf stock. How are they for like, you know, just general tips that you might have or, you know, the idea of like tending to a quince orchard? What are some of the things that you've learned along the way? You you might be thinking back and saying, geez, I wish I did this a little bit differently. Maybe the spacing, because you said you have two different spacing. One is nine, uh, nine feet and then to 12 feet. There really isn't a difference. And so the, the smaller nine foot seems to be just fine. I certainly went through a trial of varieties. There are a number of varieties that I... Uh, had to eliminate. There were trees that I actually took out um, and had to try new varieties. Uh, Since then, I've learned how to graft. So there are, uh, I've I've done a fair amount of grafting Mm -hmm. um, for varieties that, that didn't work out. Probably this area is, is not the ideal place for them to be growing because it doesn't get enough heat. Last year I had my best year ever. And that's because we, I, I think part of the reason there, you know, the thing with farming is that there's always so many variations mm-hmm. that you can never really tell exactly what you did right. But I know we had some exceptional heat last year that seemed to do pretty well. We're lucky because we do not have fire blight yeah, and wondering. fire blight it, quince is extremely susceptible to fire blight. So places who have fire blight, I would not recommend mm-hmm. trying quince. And the other thing that that I'm a little concerned about, especially this year, because we have had a, a, just a record-breaking cold, wet spring, the quince bl- blossoms were three and a half weeks late. Wow. And now I don't know if there's actually going to be enough time for them to ripen. Because and it's so cold. You're getting it so cold. It, yeah, well, and it will be cold. You know, it will be getting cold in September. So I don't know if I'm going to have enough heat units for really things to mm-hmm. be able to catch up. Mm-hmm. So this year is just a big experiment yeah. uh, about how that's going. But other than that, they're really, I mean, they're the usual kinds of pests. Again, I'm organic, and so I tolerate a certain amount of pest damage. But, you know, powdery mildew, again, because we are in a somewhat humid climate. Um, In terms of the pests for the actual fruit, sow bugs seem to love the little tops right next to to the stems. And they will eat little, little, munch little holes out out of that, which, of course, in turn, for my cider folks and and some of my co-op folks, that's not a problem. For Whole Foods, no. Right. They want it kind of perfect. They want it perfect. They want it perfect. Yes, exactly. Well, you're really unique because you're one of the few quince growers at, at this scale and with so many different varieties, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Like for the U S market and just, uh, you know, the quince community in the U S what, ha- what is that like? What, from your vantage point? Well, there is no quince community. <laughs> well, there is now. <laughs> <laughs> I've always joked that I'm the research and development station for quince, you know, so um, there are some folks now in Oregon who who are doing organic quince, and I used to be the biggest uh, 
uh, Quinn's Orchard in the Northwest, but wow. but now they they've got some more trees um, than I do. Yeah. The main area for for quince growing is in California, mm-hmm. um, and then you know th- there are some. Uh, a lot of people may have one quince tree. You know, it used to be at the turn of the uh, last century, practically every farm had a quince tree because that was such a great source of pectin. Mm-hmm. But then after commercial pectin got invented, then they didn't need quince trees anymore. Usually if people who come from here, from this country, have ever heard of quince, it's because their grandmother made quince jelly. Um, mm-hmm. But other than that, people don't know a quince, whereas most of the other uh, regions of, of this planet use quince. So, and I came from a family who were very adventurous eaters. It never occurred to me that there would be people who didn't want to try anything they didn't they didn't know about Mm -hmm. and it's it astonishes me that there are so many people i didn't realize that the bar the educational bar would be so high as to try to talk people into even tasting um Mm -hmm. something that they don't know about and of course quince is the it predates the apple it is one of the oldest fruits that we have and um, you, you go into its history and, um, you know, it's Aphrodite's fruit. The Greeks in uh, uh, B.C. actually had a law that required every newlywed couple to partake of quince prior to retiring to their marital bed. Uh, a law. <laughs> and do, do we know why? It was fertility. Just it was fertility. a fertility symbol. So yeah. maybe it was a quince in the Garden of Eden, right? That's some- that is exactly actually what um, historians believe, mm-hmm. is that it was the quince in, in the Garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. How do you consume quince? My favorite thing to do is to make a quince apple pear pie. Mm. That's a great way to introduce quince to the population. Mm. Jelly, marmalade, uh, syrup, uh, different kinds of jelly. I've made mint quince jelly, lavender, rosemary quince Mm. jelly. There definitely are um, differences in the varieties, but it's not an extreme difference. It's not the kind of difference that you experience in apples, for example. Mm-hmm. My cider makers, um, I you know give them the choice if if they want you know to try out which which ones they they want to uh, want to have. Generally, they don't care that much either because there just isn't that much that that much difference. It's mostly a difference in size or shape. Um, so there are sizes that are easier to process because they're easier to peel. If you're needing to peel, they're bigger, you get more bang for your buck, uh, that kind of thing. But taste really is not a big difference. Not so, yeah, not so extreme. And, you know, for listeners of Cider Chat, we are all about the different varieties of some of a particular fruit. So I, I do want to talk about that because you you just mentioned, well, there's some varieties that are easier to peel. Um, is that because of just their skin in general? or It's basically easy to peel because of their size. Their size, okay. Yes. So, so who, who are we talking about here? Cook's Jumbo or? Well, Cook's Jumbo, yes, definitely. Um, the Havron are, are good sized ones. The ones that are that tend to be smaller are the Aromatnayas or the Quanchings or the Kuganskayas. I was pronouncing it as Aromanaya, Aromanaya, and but that's not correct. I had someone who uh, volunteered for a day or so who spoke Russian, and she told me it's Aromatnaya. Aromatnaya, okay. Aromatnaya. Aromatnaya. There you go. I guess. Yes. Okay, good. Or right. And, and so that's like a Russian variety. And then Kugans, yes. Kuganskaya? Kuganskaya. That's a Russian variety also. Another Russian variety. 
let's go down the list here. So we cooks jumbo is what like a that's an American. That's an American, American variety. Bread. Yeah. And I was just reading actually. It's also called a golden, and that was bred by uh, one of the California growers. And then you had three different um, varieties here. Actually, uh, Dave from Alma Cider gave me these three different varieties that you, you already mentioned. The Havron, then Havron Two, and then Havron Three is an unknown true variety. Uh, you're smiling right now. What, what, what's <laughs> what is it? <laughs> About- well, this is a story. Okay. Yes. So, so, that. so when I first, one of the first varieties that I ordered was orange quince and was sent to me by a nursery that I will not name. And uh, it turned out to be diseased. And so I had to take out the, the those were 20 of those trees mm-hmm. and they offered to replace them with a a variety called Havron, which is a a Turkish variety. And so I took those and and replanted, having lost a a whole year then. They grew and, and they turned out to be really great. Then as I found other varieties that uh, there's another variety, Soyuz Naya, that split before it got ripe. Quince does have a, a, a tendency to split. Yeah, yeah. And they they split before they got ripe, and they also did not hold up in cold storage. So that's two strikes. And I ordered more Havron because by that point I realized that was really a good variety. It it got to be a good size. It was had good flavor, and it seemed not very susceptible to the um, uh, black spot. Mm-hmm. And so I ordered more of those, planted them, waited my three years. Uh, then they started coming on, and they were huge. And they split before they got ripe. It took me a while because I kept thinking, well, maybe they just need to grow up a little more. And, and I, it, it took me longer than it should have to realize it was not the same variety at all. So I, I planted those and that one turned out to be yet another variety. There was, these were supposed to be Havrons. So altogether, I had ordered 60 more trees that were supposed to be Havrons that were not Havrons. Now, fortunately, one of the... Can can I just stop you for a second? How how do you know what a Havron is if you've never grown it before? Because that's one of the things with Quinn's, like... There's not a lot of info on varieties. so Exactly, exactly. And Joseph Postman, who was uh, at the uh, Oregon State University and was kind of the quince specialist, and they, ha- they have the, probably the largest repository of quince there at Oregon State University. And what he says is that basically there are so many misnamed varieties that the only way that you can really find out what your variety is, is to have a DNA tested Mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. So all I can say, I have no idea whether that first variety is actually a Havron or not. That's what I'm calling it is a Havron because that's what was sold to me. I have no idea what the other two varieties are. So Havron two So I just started calling that, okay, that's the second variety that was supposed to be a Havron, but obviously is not. And, and those ones I, I had to graft out. So then what I had to do was get scions from my, what I'm calling our true Havrons Mm -hmm. and graft, you know, those trees out, um, the, so there's about 40 of those trees that, that you know, I'm still in the process of, of grafting those out. So I call those then Haveron 2s that are being grafted out back to the Haverons. And then the Haveron 3s are actually very good quince. I have no idea what they really are, but they are not Haverons. They, they, they're the first 
quince to ripen, which is great for me because they ripen earlier than the Havrons do. So it helps my progression of harvest. So I'm very happy with Havron threes, um, <laughs> but I have no idea what they actually are. Oh my goodness. Wow. That, that's just, it's like a chest you know, or Rubik's square kind of uh, situation. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> wow. Wow. And so are they still splitting? Cause you said that was the original problem that you took the, the orange. Cause I see you don't have any orange here on the list no. that I have. No, no. The, no, the orange got replaced with the Havrons. Mm -hmm. The Havrons did fine. The ones that were sent to me the second time are the ones that split. Uh -huh. They are on their way out. So it. almost yeah. all of them are gone. Um, I probably will leave one just because I think it's a good idea to have varieties mm -hmm. that stick around. Yeah. Um, Diversity. Yeah. Just not just in case. And then the third Havron, as I said, is just is just great. I just don't know what it really is. Mm -hmm. Boy, it, it is really like a, a, a puzzle putting this together. They do have quince repositories and quince in repositories. There's a repository in Illinois. Jerry Lehman had uh, I had met him and he had had gotten brought some in from a a Russian exchange program, um, and and that place was going to wanting to destroy the samples because they weren't being asked for, and offering him an opportunity to uh, to have some before they were destroyed, and so he had actually planted and developed them, and so he sent me some scions of of that of one of those particular ones. And there's a big repository at Oregon State University. So, so if the DNA matches one of something that they know what it is, then that's how they identify things. I'm going to go, go down this list that I still have here. And you know them so intimately. The next one I have here is not the Kukinskaya, but the... Quan Chin. Quan Chin. Yes, yeah. which is a, a Chinese one. It's not... I only have one tree left of that because it's not a very good producer uh, they're, they're small there's uh, uh, they are a little susceptible to blossom end rot oh that's another thing that um, I should talk about too is quince is susceptible to blossom end rot that will happen after they start getting ripe, and it will continue to happen in cold storage as well. In, in terms of the home gardener or people who are making cider, it doesn't really make a difference because it just goes in a little bit and it doesn't impact the fruit that, that badly unless, unless you let it sit for a long time and then it goes all through the core. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So maybe a matter of just territory is being, maybe it grows really well in China. I guess we don't yeah. really know. It, it might. Yeah. It might. Yeah. yeah. So the, we talked a little bit about Kukinskaya is something that I had in the taste test that I did with Vermont Quince Company. How, how does that do where you? Are? I love the Kukinskaya. And in fact, I'm starting to uh, graft that. One of the other things that has just started happening in the past three or four years and I don't know if it's climate related. I've talked to Joseph Postman. I've talked to, uh, you know, I've, I've gotten a hold of the Oregon folks to see if they're having the same problem. And all of us have started having this problem of internal browning happening early in the season. And um, I used to have it a little bit after they had been in, in cold storage, but I... I've had it start in other places. The Kuganskaya never has internal browning, mm. even being in, in cold storage for a long period of time. So I'm, I'm having to start grafting that because one of, well, when we get to the Zvedanaya, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. All right. So that sounds like a great variety for folks looking to maybe 
grow yeah, your own. Yeah. Your own and again, I, I can only talk about what grows well here. Of course. So, yeah. um, you know, we have a mild climate. It, it seldom gets below 20 degrees, seldom gets above 80 degrees here in the summertime. It's somewhat humid. It has good flavor too. Yes. So, yeah. so it's just, it's not as big as some of the other ones, but, mm-hmm. um, but it's, it's good sized. Cool. So the meat prolific. Meat is prolific. So uh, Mr. Meach, it, it used to be that New York was the Quince capital of, of, uh, of the country. And so Mr. Meach was a, uh, a quince grower and he uh, hybridized this particular uh, fruit and named it after himself. Meech is prolific. And what is it like? I Again, I'm not entirely sure. I got, you know, I wanted to have it just because of that history. And he has a book that uh, is the only book that exists about growing quince. And it's from the 1800s. Well, I really wanted that variety. So I got it from, from an orchard in the Southern United States that's no longer in business and no longer has it. It has very good flavor. And it also has what I can only call like a birthmark. It has these fuzzy little, you know, kind of growths on the outside of it. So it's completely not a commercial variety. Mm. Um, and I don't know if that is something that's a, a disease or if does it cover the whole quince? Because all no, quince have a little no. bit of fuzz on it that you can. Oh no, wipe this up. is not. No, this is not fuzz. Okay. This is it. It is fuzzy, but it's like a birthmark, a fuzzy birthmark that's okay. quite brown, and it's not over the entire quince. It's just on on part of it. So. It's commercially inviable. However, it's in the ARC, the program of saving heritage trees. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got it. And I think I'm one of the only people now that even have them anymore. Mm -hmm. So I want to keep them just because of, of, of that reason. But I haven't tried grafting them to see if that, whatever that condition is, is going to transfer over into a grafted now that I think of it, I should probably try doing that. To see what ha- see what happens. Yeah, um, why not? So yeah. yeah, but it is it's come through in in the taste testings that that I did early on. It was one of the top top ones. Oh, cool backstory. I love it. So how about Queens? Queens is a named a named quince. It's it was actually bred by Mister Lyle. I think came from Ohio. That's turned out to not be a viable commercial quince at all. It's very small and uh, it is sweeter, but it's not, it's not very prolific either. Smyrna then? Well, Smyrna is a Turkish one. That's another one that I did not have that much success with. So I only have one left. Um, Again, it was small, tended to be quite small, also uh, quite susceptible to that black spot. So I, I grafted it out mm. with the Hagron. And then we, the next one I have here is Tashkent. Tashkent, yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I have only two of those. Uh, and they are, they're, they're good. Again, I was trying a whole bunch of varieties. So some of them, I just have a few of. They are medium size, seem to not have too much problems with the, with the black spot. Because I had so few of them, there's, there's no way that I'm going to like mm-hmm. keep grafting mm-hmm. them mm-hmm. because I need large quantities of, of single varieties. Right. Are you saying it as Tosh? Tosh Kent. I think that's another Turkish one. The next one, is that Dutch? Van Damen. Van Damen. That was bred by Luther Burbank. From California. Yeah. So this one is uh, a good one, an, early, an earlier one, uh, good size. Uh, good taste. It's a. It's susceptible to that black spot. However, hmm. so 
Um, That's a problem for, for somebody who's trying yeah. to sell it to the grocery store yeah. market. Yeah. Yeah, Darn. exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then the last one, is this the last one that you have? Yes, it is. Okay. Can you pronounce that for us? <laughs> Zvedstanaya. Z- that's, that's Zvedstanaya. 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 Yes. And it's a Russian one. Russian. And it is the one that Jerry Lehman um, gave me the scions for. It's an absolutely beautiful one. And, and he said that it was really great for cider. Uh, it's, it's this, they're huge apple shaped. I mean, just completely apple shaped. Most of the other ones are, um, kind of a little bit of a lumpy apple shaped or pear shaped, but these ones just are absolutely gorgeous and they are sweeter than the other varieties. So I was very excited about getting these after I grafted them on and they have that internal browning. And you can't see anything from the outside. They're not viable for retail. They would be great, I think, Mm -hmm. for cider. You know, quince does not ripen successfully off the tree. You'll see all kinds of stuff on the internet that says, oh, yeah, they just put them on the windowsill and they'll turn soft. Well, quince really never turns soft. (laughs) And, and if they they don't ever develop their full fragrance or taste off the tree so my whole uh, thing from the very beginning has been this is tree ripened fruit and the problem with quince of course in terms of retail quality is it's it seems as hard as a rock mm-hmm. but it bruises at the slightest mm-hmm. pinch of your fingers. And so when my workers are harvesting, I basically am always telling them, you have to handle these like eggs um, because you will bruise them just if you hold them too hard. And if you, you know, hit them against the ladder or any other thing, then they're not going to be retail quality. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Edith, for everything that you're doing for going on this journey and choosing quince and helping it to prosper and to have these varieties and have this knowledge bank that you offer to your community in the Pacific Northwest and really now via Cider Chat to the world who is is really rooting for quince, this kind of forgotten fruit that has so much substance to it, both in the aroma and it's, it's beautiful and it's history. So you're really doing something amazing that is setting generations to come to be able to look back on you and what your work is doing here in the U S is really a treasure. So I want to thank you for that. And thank you for your time today. Thank you. I am in Queen's Heaven just listening to Edith once again. It was so awesome and really quite a privilege to be able to talk to her. The things she's been doing with Quince for so many years. Now, if you want to check out all the names of each Quince that we spoke of, go to the show notes for this year, episode 327, and you'll see them listed there. In addition, you'll also see a fantastic photo of the orchard. Then you also see links to the two books we talked about, One was William Meech's book called The Quince Culture, an Illustrated Handbook for the Propagation and Cultivation of Quince. And that's dating back to 1800s, but it's still pertinent today. And the other is Barbara Gazarian's book. Remember, she is the queen of quince, whereas Edith is the quince queen. (laughs) And Barbara wrote the book called Simply Quince. So you'll find the links there. Now, I gave you a little hint before this podcast begun that... Edith is looking at transitioning. She's starting to like consider that. And of course, one option is to set up a trust of sort for the quince. Of course, there's that amazing Gravenstein tree there too. And obviously the quince grow well there. The other option is she would, you know, if you have a thought about this, if you want to become a quince grower, you might want to contact her. But of course, it's going to be serious inquiries only. And, and there is an email that you can contact her 
at, and that is also in the show notes for this here episode. And I know that there's a lot of folks out there in Ciderville who are just digging quins, trying to find out more, and she is just a wealth of info. She's also growing arona berries there too on the property, and a lot of folks use arona berries because they're very high in tannin, so it's a nice little supplement to cider. And um, yeah, it's also within the family of rosacea too. Again, tip of the glass to Edith. Thank you so much. And and simply check out the show notes once again for this year episode 327 at ciderchat.com. And with that, I leave you here. This is Rhea Wincaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. Strange apples, bitter shop. Strange apples, juice and rap. Bop, 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 Who wants a tan and bomb? I want a tan and bomb. Who wants to pull them down? I'm gonna pull them down. Hey, hey, hey. Sweet Strange apples Hanging high Got them strange apples Forget the pie Strange apples Squeeze them tight Got them strange I'm gonna pull them down. Hey, 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 apples. Come and see. Plenty strange apples for you and me. Strange apples. Strange apples. Strange apples. Pop, 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 pop,